Hello YouTube, uh, today we're going to be talking about Ed Gettio's article, Is Justified True Belief Knowledge? Um, so we're just going to be introducing one of the classic pieces of um, contemporary epistemology and I think that's it. I think that's all I need to say you as an introduction. You Ed <laughs> like he's your bro. <laughs> <laughs> Good old Ed Gettier. <laughs> well, that's how I've heard people say his name. And do, they, so, do you guys call him Ed? Well, I, some people call him Ed. I've heard Ed Gettier. Isn't, oh. isn't that? I don't know. Like, I've always heard Edmund, Edmund Gettier. Well, or just Gettier. <laughs> yeah, Gettier, Edmund Gettier. Uh, you say Gettier. Yeah, I'm just pronouncing it. Hmm. The way it's written. Are you I, making him French? I thought it was. I assumed it was. It, it seemed French to me. It looked. I've French. always just heard Gettier. Wow. Oh. oh, okay. Well, I'm going to carry no on worries. saying it, however it, however it comes out, and that seems fine. I could from. be like one of those people who's saying Nietzsche. <laughs> it doesn't. <matter. laughs> In this situation. I think everybody knows who we're talking about. Um, oh. So. Do you need to say anything? <laughs> um, no, I think it's worth uh, saying that we're, we're not just going over uh, his three-page paper. We're going to go over also like what the impetus for doing this is and uh, how one would a analyze the concept of knowledge uh, so we can evaluate when somebody has it and when somebody doesn't. Yeah. Um, so, and maybe a little background logic as well, which is... Yeah, okay. Um, so where I thought it would be good to start would be to, yeah, just, just to, to situate this paper, just to explain what he's doing. Um, I mean, I, I think this, this paper is a brilliant example of what we call conceptual analysis, which is one of the primary tools of, um, one of the primary tools of contemporary philosophy. Um, and this essentially involves breaking down concepts in order to find out the logical relations between them. Um, so a classic example would be something like uh, a bachelor is an unmarried man. So we can engage in, in this conceptual analysis of bachelor. We can break down the concept of bachelor into its constituent parts, as it were. And so we would say that you know X, where X is just like a random person, X is a bachelor. Um, if and only if uh, X is unmarried and X is a man. Um, so we've broken down Bachelor into its constituent parts. And Bachelor is not a very interesting case, but you can apply this same sort of tool to more interesting cases. Um, and what we're doing here is we're trying to find the necessary and sufficient conditions for the application of the concept. Um, so being unmarried is a necessary condition for being a bachelor, because you can't be a bachelor if you're married. Um, if you're an unmarried man, that's a sufficient condition for being a bachelor. All unmarried men are bachelors. I, I like to use uh, the example of fire uh, with my students when I'm teaching them this, uh, because there are conditions under which uh, you might have fire, um, and then there are conditions that guarantee fire. Um, and I think that distinction between guaranteeing and potentially having is a unimportant one to start with. Yeah, although I don't know if I like that example, because in the case of fire, you're dealing with causal sufficiency and causal necessity ah that not necessarily okay. not necessarily so maybe you go with me on this i don't like bachelor um, well the reason why i i choose bachelor is because it's <laughs> like in the, in the case of bachelor you are dealing with conceptual relations like just logical relations and that's what okay, you're dealing I... with in the case of knowledge so that's why i use that example Fair enough. And maybe this is just a uh, teaching in person thing because I love being like, okay, what do we need to have fire? Yeah. What what is necessary to have fire? Right? And you shout something out. What would you shout out, Kane? Oxygen. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You you can't have fire. Literally, if you don't have oxygen, you cannot have fire. What else do you need? Some sort of source of ignition. Um, not necessarily. Well, I don't. Know. Yeah, but you do need a combustible <laughs> material, yeah. right? You need something to be combusting. <laughs> Um, and then this is the one that I think you made you resistant to this. I would say sufficient heat. Um, you don't need a source of combustion. You can just have sufficient heat and things will burst into flames. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. So <clears throat> you need to have all of those things in order to have fire. You can't take any one of those out of the equation. So we would call them necessary conditions for fire. Um, oxygen on its own is necessary for fire. Um, a combustible material on its own is necessary for fire. And sufficient heat, be it in the form of a spark or uh, the sun's rays or uh, metabolic processes, whatever. Um, sufficient heat is necessary for fire. Um, any one of those alone is not going to give you fire. Right? You don't have fire just because you have the presence of oxygen. But it is necessary to have fire. So those on their own are the necessary conditions. And if you put them all together, if you have oxygen, a combustible material, and sufficient heat, you are guaranteed fire. And that's when we know we have the sufficient conditions for fire. But I just like it because it's participatory. <laughs> So, yeah. bachelor works just as well, right? Um, if you don't have a man, uh, you don't have a bachelor. Yeah, I mean... Uh, if he's married, you don't have a bachelor. Yeah, if he's married, you don't have a bachelor. I mean, may, may, I don't know, maybe maybe I can cut this bit out. I'm, I'm not sure. No, I, I just, like it. I, I don't, this is good. The trouble with the fire example is that those are, those are causal conditions. And, like, it's not necessary and sufficient conditions for the application of the concept of fire uh, or at least it doesn't seem to be like we could have discovered that fire is caused by other things um, like I don't know maybe God snaps his fingers and produces fire right maybe God snaps his fingers and makes people bachelors and I, he, I, but, I but, but, presumably he couldn't snap his fingers and make an unmarried a, a married man a bachelor I, I, um, I mean I, if you're taking like Kant's God yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, Actually, but... no, because then it wouldn't be fire. It'd be like fission or something else. Mm. Yeah, but now we're just debating about what the concept of fire is. Like, I don't think that the concept of fire involves uh, that fire is like by definition something caused by, you know, a source of heat and oxygen and a combustible material. I might be crazy. I'm pretty sure that's the example my textbook uses because it's so uncontroversial. <laughs> okay, I don't. I almost don't feel like looking this up, but I'm like 99% sure that it's the example my textbook uses for explaining necessary and sufficient conditions. I mean, yeah, you could totally explain necessary and sufficient conditions with that. Um... But we're not what we're not doing in the case of in, in Gettier's article is we're not looking for um, the causally necessary and sufficient conditions for knowledge. Like we're not we're not making causal claims. We're not making a claim about how knowledge is acquired. Um, yeah, I took saying? it to be definitional as well. Um, but if you have a problem with it, well, that's, I, I just that's... think that like. Okay, let's just put it this way. I think that the, the example of fire can be interpreted either way. Okay, it's 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 too loose for you. Whereas the example of say a bachelor doesn't seem to be open to interpretation in the same kind of way. Yeah, and we could do it with a square, right? Yeah, square. Um, I just I, I like I like fire because it's a participatory when you're teaching it, um, but also. Because you can, it, it's it's a bit more detailed than a square or a bachelor, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's true. Um, you you kind of got to think about it a little more. Um, Have we just like screwed up teaching? 
teaching I mean, if, if we've screwed up teaching Gettier, then I've been screwing up teaching Gettier for a very long time. No, I mean, this, like, <laughs> us kind of disagreeing about, I mean, this is, we've gone on this tangent about how best to explain necessary and sufficient conditions in the case of... I, it's all philosophy, <laughs> Kane. Um, I don't think so. I, I find it all valuable. Uh, you can keep it or <laughs> cut it. Um, Entirely you. I might just upload this whole thing. And Yeah, the, I, you, you have my consent. Uh, I'm not troubled by the idea that it might be interpreted as a causal explanation as opposed to... I'm not saying one thing leads to another. I'm saying the presence of these things in conjunction yeah. definitionally yeah. is fire. I don't know if this story is true, but when I uh, first learn or when I first read uh, is justified true belief knowledge, uh, I was either a an undergraduate freshman or sophomore, and my professor told this story, and uh, I, I'm going to repeat it now. Um, apparently, he, uh, he 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 was operating under this like publish or perish sort of situation. Yeah. Uh, and people were encouraging him to write something. And little did they expect him to write a three-page paper that completely upset our definition of knowledge, essentially, since Plato. Um, Plato had put forth, more or less, uh, the necessary and sufficient conditions for knowledge, uh, which is a justified true belief. And for roughly 2,000 years, we were happy with that. <laughs> and then Raymond Gettier, or not Raymond, Edmund Gettier, you messed me up calling him Ed, uh, came along and was like, no, no, those are not, in fact, the necessary and sufficient conditions for knowledge because I can show that somebody has those things but doesn't have knowledge. Yeah. And that's what this paper does. It's very exciting. So this would be almost like if I showed that I had uh, either, you know, oxygen, a combustible material, and adequate heat, but didn't have fire. Or there was a fellow who was unmarried and male, mm -hmm. and he was not a bachelor. Uh, we, we would know there is something wrong with our definition. Um, yeah. We know there's something wrong with, uh, with yeah, our, our concept of this. If I were able to demonstrate that, no, I can indeed have those those things, I can have the sufficient conditions for something without having achieved the thing. There's actually more to that story from what Is I Is there? Well, um, I heard that... Okay, when Ooh, he let's was... get into legend. <laughs> so... I heard that when Gettier was like at some meeting to determine whether or not he was going to be employed for the next, you know, <laughs> next year. Um, <laughs> this is probably false, but apparently, like somebody, one of his colleagues, like literally just brought in a bag full of responses to his paper and like <laughs> dumped it on the desk uh, for him. Uh, um, I know that uh, that that professor I had, uh, he said people really wanted him to offer up something uh, in the place of justified true belief as knowledge. Mm. Um, and he never did. Yeah. I <laughs> and I kind of right. love that. Yeah. I think that's the heart of philosophy, right? Like, I, I don't know. what Should he have not said anything? <laughs> should he have just sat on his hands and been like, oh, no, <laughs> I don't have anything to replace it with. So it must be right. No, he he didn't do that. He just yeah. was like, I found a problem. Here's the problem. Get to work. I mean, um, <laughs> I wrote my paper, <laughs> my three page paper. It also might just be worth noting that uh, like one, one of the reasons why this is worth doing in this case, like, so, you know, because if you if you say, well, a bachelor is an unmarried man, then it's like, OK, you're just giving a definition of bachelor. And that's not that's not really a particularly interesting piece of conceptual analysis. Right. You can find that out from a dictionary. Um, but with knowledge, knowledge is kind of important. It's it's a more significant <laughs> concept and it's a concept where there's actually, 
you know, th th there's a lot of uh, there's, there's a lot of questions that can be raised about what exactly knowledge is and when do we have knowledge and what's the scope of our knowledge and all of this. And so that's why we want to get clear on what exactly the concept of knowledge is. Um, so that's why this yeah, is. I mean I, I, I get a lot of, of pushback interest. from students because they want to say a belief is just the same as knowledge. Uh, and I, I can see how coming to this naively you might think that, but it seems like there are important distinctions uh, that, that we want to clarify or when people make knowledge claims, when they claim to know something um, or when they believe themselves to know something. That's important. Mm -hmm. That's more important in my estimation than somebody being like, I believe myself to be a bachelor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so... So how did he do it in three pages? Whew. Oh, um, <laughs> there's another thing that we should clarify here as well, actually, which okay. is... exciting. Well, we're, so Gettier is interested in what we call propositional knowledge. Um, so there are... Uh, different yeah, kinds different of, knowledge, of knowledge, right? <laughs> and these would require different types of analysis. Um, so we sometimes say that somebody knows how to ride a bike, for instance. Um, so this is like knowledge how. You know how to do something. This is a matter of skill. It's a matter of practice. Um, what Getier is interested in... I also know you. Oh, yeah. That's there's another, another type uh, of knowledge would be kind of... Familiarity. A, yeah. Um, which is to say, I know Kane. Um, does that mean that I like knowledge Kane? <laughs> I don't know what that would mean. Well, yeah. Um, so there's 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 like knowledge how there's knowledge of how to do things. There's knowledge of things maybe knowledge by acquaintance. Um, yeah, familiarity. Is... Yeah. So that we use the term in all of these different ways. Um, Gettier is specifically interested in what we call propositional knowledge, which is basically knowing that a proposition is true. Um, so you know that uh, the Earth orbits the sun. Um, you know that Santa Claus doesn't exist. You know that water is H2O. You know that all bachelors are unmarried, right? Um, so it's, you can kind of replace, you, you have X knows that, and then you put a sentence in there. Um, that's the kind of knowledge that Gettier is talking about. So we want the necessary and sufficient conditions for somebody to know a proposition. Um, is that an adequate yeah, explanation um, of, of uh, the difference? I, I, I think it's, it's really important to note that this is the only kind of knowledge that really can be true or false. Yes. Um, like, uh, my knowing you can't be false. Yeah, that's right? a good way to put it. Um, my knowledge of a skill, uh, I know how to do my nails fantastically well um, right that, that whether or not it's fantastic could be true or false but that i i have that skill can't really be true or false i i have i can have it in degrees um it's something that's developed whereas propositional knowledge is is going to be true or false and that's going to play a huge role in how we analyze it so that's a really important part of our analysis of it it's one of the three parts yeah. of it <laughs> so uh, worth noting that propositional knowledge uh, is truth functional it can be true or false yeah well propositions can be true or false well propositions yeah. can be true or false the knowledge yeah. has to be true yeah uh, so I guess should we state yeah, the seems I mean, like a good place yeah. to get started um, okay then yeah so uh, well as Gettier says there's been these attempts to state the necessary and sufficient conditions for someone knowing a given proposition and then he states the traditional definition of, of knowledge in philosophy, the justified true belief account. Um, so the way he puts it is, S knows that P, where P is a proposition, um, like water is H2O. So S knows that P, if and only if, P is true, S believes that P, and S is justified in believing that P. Um, and yeah, I mean, the first part of this paper, he just gives some examples of people who have adopted this kind of view, right? I mean, there's different words you can use. Not everybody would use the word justification. Um, 
some people might say S has adequate evidence for P uh, or S has the right to be sure that P or whatever, but these are basically just forms of the same idea, right? It has to be justified true belief. Um, Quick note so, for people unfamiliar with uh, philosophy or logic, IFF means if and only if. Um, if you are looking at the paper, probably worth yeah, saying IFF yeah. means if and only if. If you see that, you know that somebody is giving you necessary and sufficient conditions. Um, which is it's also worth noting, that means that if those conditions are fulfilled, knowledge is supposed to be guaranteed yeah. in the same way that if somebody is unmarried and male, it is guaranteed that they're a bachelor. Um, or in the same way with you know our three examples of necessary conditions for fire or i don't know uh four sides of equal length uh guarantees a square um so it's the these aren't they're meant to guarantee the object of your investigation uh, yeah and that's that's the assertion is that if you have these things you have guaranteed knowledge well, so it's, yeah, I mean, if if S knows that P, then S has justified true belief that P. So justified true belief is necessary for knowledge. And if S has justified true belief that P, then S knows that P. So justified true belief is sufficient for knowledge. Yeah, right, I just like, like to emphasize, right the, the, I, I like to emphasize <laughs> yeah. the guarantee. Yeah, it's, yeah. um, you, you've defined it in such a way that if you have these things, it is guaranteed to be knowledge. Um, um, also worth noting, you moved over it a little quickly. Uh, when I explained that uh, the necessary and sufficient conditions for knowledge are justified true belief, uh, a lot of people want to push back on various things. Why does it need to be true? Right? Oh, yeah, Why yeah no, I, I was going to go into this. Yeah, I didn't mean to move okay. over this. Yeah, I thought okay, we should talk okay. about this. Uh, um, a quick thing to note is that one of these things changes a lot <laughs> um, in his different examples. Uh, and that if you're detecting that early on as a weak spot in this like definition of knowledge, that's a good instinct to have. But let's talk about why these are. Yeah. Um, so actually, I mean, I should say that the, the, the one, the part where I tend to get pushed back on this when, whenever I've, talked about this with people who are lay persons let's say is the belief part because a lot of people seem to use belief in much more restrictive ways than philosophers do so i think it's important uh, to state yeah. that when a philosopher talks about a belief right literally a belief is just a matter of accepting a proposition right it's like anything that you would like any time any proposition that you would kind of say yes to right like yes that's true that's a belief. So I believe that my car is parked outside right now. Oh, right? I'm glad you, that's the example I used to. Really? Okay, well, there you go. Right? And it, we're, we're synced back up. Know. So so belief, I mean, my point is, you know, belief isn't, what would be the word? It's, it's not like a kind of significant thing. It's not like, you know, belief in God, say. Some people think belief requires faith. That's not how philosophers use the term. Um, well, and belief is distinct from knowledge because I can definitely believe that my car is parked outside okay. without knowing that my car is parked outside. Um, in fact, the when I wouldn't know that my car was parked outside is a great example of this. So yeah. um, how would I know that my car was parked outside? Well, it would have to be true that my car was parked outside. If it was false, then I would have a mere belief. Yeah. Um, if I didn't believe my car was parked outside, then I couldn't know that my car was parked outside. So we definitely need me to believe it as well. And then I'd have to have a good reason, a justification, a warrant, um, adequate evidence yeah. um, is another example from the text, whatever. Um, I'm gonna keep using justified. I I'd, I'd have to be justified um, in believing that my car was parked outside. So. If, for example, I had taken a train to work um, rather than driving to work, uh, I, I would not be justified in believing that my car had just materialized outside. Um, so it's only with all three of these. I have to think it's out there. I have to believe it's out there. 
Um, I have to have a good reason to believe that. And it has to be true because if somebody has up and stolen my car, then I definitely don't know that it's parked outside. I just believe it's parked outside. Yeah. Um, so that, that's, that's why we think that these are the three things necessary for knowledge. Yeah. If that makes sense. Do and people, it's also how we distinguish between belief and knowledge, at least as far as I'm concerned. We do, do you say that people put, tend to push back on the truth part of it? And... Um, no, I mean, yeah, they they'll push back on all of them. Okay. Uh, well, if, if they're clever, they push back on the justification. Yeah, I mean, I, I did want to just mention something about that. Actually, it's like okay, so. I mean, to me, it seems fairly intuitive that, yes, right, if if you know something, then it has to be something that you correctly believe. It has to be a true belief. Um, but, like, why does knowledge require more than that? Um, and I, I guess that there's a thought that, well, you, you want to rule out things like people just having lucky guesses. Um, so but I might, for instance, yeah. Yeah, I might, for instance, uh, form the belief that it's going to rain tomorrow um, just on the basis of flipping a coin or on the basis of consulting my crystal ball. Um, and the thought is, even if that's true, even if it is actually going to rain tomorrow, so even if I'm right, I, I don't have good enough evidence or I, I maybe haven't used a reliable method of forming my belief or something like that. I don't have a good reason to have the belief that I do. So even though it's true, it's not really knowledge. Like knowledge is, it needs more than true belief. It needs to actually be, be something supported by good reasons, by justification. Um, I like to give so. the example of uh, somebody giving you an antidote for an illness. <laughs> and yeah. let's, let's say you, you, you've been poisoned uh, and somebody is like, oh, this, uh, this dirt, <laughs> it, uh, it, it, it's, I, I, I know that it, uh, it'll cure you. And you're like, well, why? <laughs> And they're like, well, I believe it. And then it later turns out to be true. I don't know. I'd say that person was still a quack. They just got lucky. Yeah. Um, I'm certainly glad that I ate the dirt or that they put it in my wound or whatever. Um, but they didn't have knowledge. They weren't basing that on anything. Maybe, you know, that soil had the necessary chemicals in it to relieve my illness. Or maybe it didn't. It could have gone either way. It wasn't knowledge. They didn't know. Now, if they said, oh, you know, I studied uh, herbalism and natural medicine or something, and I have not, like in the old school way, not in the woo magic way. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I know a lot about plants and this plant can only grow in this kind of soil. And from that, I've concluded that the soil has the antidote in it. Yeah. Okay, now that's knowledge. You, you've given me your justification uh, for believing this. You didn't just get lucky. Yeah. So, and, I mean, hopefully you would ask for that sort of justification before just rubbing dirt in your wounds, right? This is, this is a standard that we have yeah. uh, latently, even if we've never recognized that we want people's beliefs to be justified before they can say they know something. Uh, if you put yourself in that situation, the need for justification uh, seems really apparent, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, I think that's a good example. Um, <laughs> so, so I guess I guess that covers why philosophers accepted this idea of justified true belief. I mean, there there are definitely ways of pushing back on this. I mean, I don't know. I don't think we really need to go into this, but it, it is worth flagging up. Like, you totally can raise questions about, like, okay, well, what exactly is truth? And certainly, you can ask, what exactly is justification? I mean, you know how much justification is required uh, like what what counts as a good reason to believe something um you know because there's different types of evidence and so how much evidence is required for knowledge uh that's not really going to be relevant to what Gettier is talking about though so um like for the purposes of Gettier's article you can have whatever standards for just it well maybe not whatever but a number of different standards of justification will will work let's Satisfying. say right it's um, um and, and the, the problem with having a more if your response to the two problems 
uh, maybe we should discusses and then we discuss is that well, well, these people do, do you think have maybe sufficient... we should do this no later? no want uh, do this i want to do this now okay. if if you start to get the feeling that these people didn't have sufficient justification uh, your immediate reaction to that should be, if I narrow my definition of justification, am I precluding cases where people definitely have knowledge? So whatever uh, idea you have locked in your mind of justification, uh, it, we want to make sure it's narrow enough to exclude lucky guesses but also broad enough to not exclude circumstances where somebody definitely has knowledge. Um, so be, be cautious in your, your narrowing of justification. Yeah. I mean, so maybe like we should just, I don't know, what would you say is an example of knowledge? I'd say the Earth orbits the center of mass of the solar system, right? Um, well, maybe that I counts. would say China, China exists. I know that China okay. exists. Uh, uh, I've never seen it or directly experienced it. Right. But I know it exists and that's why I choose it, because I've never seen it or in any way directly experienced. It. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Well, I think either of those examples probably works. China exists, I suppose, is even more obvious, isn't it? Um, like we're not certain about that. I mean, neither yeah. of us can be. It's logically possible that we're wrong. Uh, like maybe there is just a big conspiracy and uh, like thousands of people have just created fake evidence that there's this country, right? I mean, it's po it's possible, right? That could, right? That, that's a logically possible state of affairs. Um, but it looks like given all the photographs we have of China, given the testimony from literally hundreds of thousands of people, um, that looks like good enough justification to think that China exists. Uh, yeah, yeah, and we 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 wouldn't want to exclude yeah. uh, our knowledge of China existing uh, in our definition of justification. Just like you know, yeah, it's entirely possible that the uh, solar system could be geocentric. Mm. Um, I, I mean, I suppose like logically possible. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and this uh, has has all just been. A hilarious joke that's been played on us. Um, the, I, I don't know. People just enjoy pranking <laughs> students or something. <laughs> um, I don't need to think of a reason for it. It, it is possible, but I want to say that I know the solar system is heliocentric. Yeah, and um, so justification isn't a matter of having certainty. Uh, I suppose would be the the thing here. It's yeah. like we. It's possible to have justification but be wrong. Um, it's possible yeah. to have a justified false belief. In which that case, you definitely knowledge. wouldn't know it. <laughs> no, you wouldn't know it. But like you know, you it, it look you, know, you can have a justified belief that's that's false. And I think that yeah, I mean, for the purposes of Gettier's article, we can kind of operate with a fairly intuitive understanding of what. Like, I mean, intuitively, I think most people have a grasp of what truth is, and most people have a grasp of what it means for something to be based on good evidence and good reasoning. Um, so, And there's a, a lot of work um, done just on this. Uh, if people are interested and you're like, no, that's that was too fast and loose for me. <laughs> uh, the reason Gettier offers uh, a couple other um, necessary and sufficient conditions for knowledge is because people tend to... Uh, be uncomfortable with such a loose definition of justification. I don't know that he has the uh, the warrant one in here, but uh, that's probably my favorite. Yeah. Um, it was warranted in believing. Uh, and it's not wrong that a different formulation of this might solve some of the problems he presents, uh, but it's not clear that any different formulation does solve this problem. So... Um, yeah, let's yeah. let's get into these these cases. So, if you're uh, what Gettier, just to be clear about what Gettier is actually arguing, um, he's going to present some cases which try to show that the justified true belief account is not a sufficient condition for knowledge. Um, so he says that here on the first page. He says it's false in that the conditions stated therein do not constitute a sufficient condition for the truth of the proposition that S knows the P. Um, so he he's not concerned about 
whether or not they're, ne they're necessary conditions, he's just going to argue that they're not sufficient. He's going to argue that justified true belief doesn't guarantee knowledge. So you can have justified true belief without having knowledge. That's what his cases are trying to show. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, there is a little bit of a... Did you want to go right into the cases or do you want to talk about uh, entailment? Um, I don't mind. I mean, we can explain that if... Yeah, so this bit here... I think we where, should explain that yeah. maybe after the um, case so we can see entailment in action. Okay, then. Let's... So make note. Entailment. <laughs> let's, let's move on then to case one. Um, ah. Yeah. Uh, do you want me to read this, or well, do you want I don't, to I don't want mind. To read? <laughs> do you, okay, well, I, I just said the last thing, so why don't you say this one? I'm, okay, I'm, I'm... Uh, suppose that Smith and Jones have applied for a certain job, and suppose that Smith has strong evidence for the following conjunctive proposition. Jones is the man who will get the job, and Jones has ten coins in his pocket. So, brief note here, uh... It's a conjunctive proposition, so both parts of it have to be true in order for it to be true. Mm. So um, yeah. he's got that marked as sentence D. Uh, it might be tedious, but I will try to actually repeat the sentences where possible um, rather than just saying D. But yeah. uh, suppose Smith's evidence for D, that conjunctive proposition, might be that the president of the company has assured him that Jones would be in the end selected and that he smith had counted the coins in jones pocket 10 minutes ago okay so what gettier is doing here is just saying he he's justified yeah um in oh i've dropped my headphones um he's justified in believing this um why is he justified well the president of the company has personally assured him that jones would get the job and I, I think we all agree that in most cases that's perfectly fair justification. Um, yeah, I mean, so, so just has, as a, uh, I mean, aside, in case people are inclined to push back on this, like, it's worth noting yeah. we do just rely on people's testimony, right? Like, quite a lot. Um, so if you say that that's not good enough justification, it looks like you're not going to be able to rely on the testimony of others that's anymore. Fine. And... I don't know. You might be yeah, willing to accept you, that. Well, but... you've also made your definition of justification too narrow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, like... Now, there are all sorts of things. In fact, if you make your de definition of justification that narrow, you don't know that China exists unless you've been there personally. Hmm. I mean, um, it, it looks like we often rely on, on other people's, on what other people say. And so, um, but yeah, uh, sorry for yeah, interrupting. So, um, all, all Gadir is doing is uh, providing what he thinks we will all agree is sufficient justification for the first part of the conjunctive proposition, which is Jones is the man who will get the job. And then his justification for believing the second bit, Jones has 10 coins in his pocket, is that he personally counted them. Maybe Jones was just like rifling around in his pocket or something. Um, we, we don't know. Uh, but he, he saw them personally and counted such them a, such personally. Such a weird example. I love to imagine the, the situation in which you're like waiting outside for a job interview and like some guy's just like emptying all his pockets and you're like man 10 coins <laughs> <laughs> that guy's got him <laughs> lucky guy he's got both the job and 10 coins in his pocket anyway uh this is entailment now and this is a really important move um that proposition the conjunctive proposition jones is the man who will get the job and jones <clears throat> jones has 10 coins in his pocket entails that the man who will get the job has 10 coins in his pocket, right? So if D is true, then E necessarily must be true. There is no way out of that. Um, and this is where my initial instinct to push back was because I was like, you can't say the man. Yeah, I, <laughs> um, I agree with you on this. <laughs> did, did you have that? I was like, you, you I... can't just say the man i agree completely um, uh, 
Yeah, I don't think but, this example works actually, but I think it does. Um, oh, I don't think it does. It is entirely true that that entailment follows. Um, so I, I have I, big, and big problems with this. For my students who have problems with this, uh, I say, A, well, you know, I, I want to teach Gettier, so we, we got to get through it. Yeah. But if you can show me a situation in which D is true and E is not true, um, we, we've got a paper to write. Uh, we, we should get on this uh, because any time that D is true, Jones is the man who will get the job and Jones has 10 coins in his pocket. E is also going to be true. Uh, the man who will get the job has 10 coins in his pocket. Um, I, I still, I also don't think it's great to go from Jones to the man. Yeah. I, um, I don't know. Should, I don't think we should go down this tangent. I'm not sure. It, it, like, not at all. Yeah. What's your objection? Because um, you're I going from the specific think... to the general. Uh, okay, I, I, I guess, guess if this is irrelevant, I can cut it out. But I don't think anybody actually has the belief, right? Because we're talking about beliefs here. I don't. I don't think anyone has the belief that the man in the abstract will. Ha the man who will get the job has ten coins in his pocket. I think that the man, right, literally just refers to Jones. So it's a question yeah. of whether you're treating the man in a descriptive or referential sense. And I think it's referential. What you actually believe is that Jones has 10 coins in his pocket and Jones will get the job. So that move that Gettier makes here, I just don't accept. Um, I, I I don't like it that much either for that. No, I don't think that's a tangent at all. I think this is great. This is seeing people do philosophy. Um, and I think it's important that people engage with uh, papers like this and see that there are various ways to attack it. Um, so I also think that no one is thinking the man. <laughs> uh, and the reason we're pushing so hard right now will become clear momentarily. Um, but the way uh, it's been explained to me is A, you can definitely go from the specific to the general mm -hmm. like that. That is logically a legitimate move uh, to go from Jones to the man. And, you know, bless my freshman philosophy professor because he said, maybe they're interviewing for a philosophy job and this guy's just playing games. Um, he knows it has to be a known entailment. He has to know that that is entailed. Mm -hmm. So already for him to be thinking these things is a bit ridiculous. Yeah. Like it is a ridiculous case. <laughs> However, um, it, let's just make the story a little more robust. Uh, they're interviewing for a tenure track philosophy position and he's just playing little logic games in his head. He's super into entailment and he's like, man, I can derive from D this proposition which I will now accept because I am a logician. Yeah. Um, and uh, again, bless that man's heart because I pushed real hard on this and uh, I've, I've never had anything to say in response to that. It is entirely possible that if this scenario were depicting people interviewing for like the position of, you know, tenure logician, uh, he, he could, we think weird things. Philosophers definitely play weird little logic games in our own little head, and I heads, and I can definitely see. Don't tell me you've never been sitting around being like, "Hmm, I can think this funny thought." <laughs> Would you look at that? I know you've done it because I've done it too. Yeah, that's, so that's fair let's uh, let's adopt the principle of charitability here, uh, and be charitable and say, "All right, it's not impossible. Not nobody thinks this thought." This thought has never been thought before. It has been thought. It's just only been thought by like possibly weirdo logicians and philosophers and such. But uh, I mean, there's no logical yeah, reason this, like, this can't this doesn't work. I think I think certainly the the logical entailment from D to E is fairly straightforward, right? Like because because D literally says that Jones will get the job and Jones has ten coins in his pocket um, and Jones is a man, right? So. The man who'll get the job has ten coins in his pocket. That that's fair. Like that's that's perfect. There's no reasonable. way out of it. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, okay then. So it's not more silly than him counting his pocket coins. No, that's true. I mean, this is a, a very <laughs> weird example. And actually, I suppose maybe. I mean, we'll we'll, we'll maybe 
present we also have to imagine examples later, later, but, for the um, ah yeah maybe they'll have to do with red barns right yeah. um <laughs> but um yeah I, so anyway <laughs> do, shall we move on yeah so uh uh yeah so then um Gessier says, imagine further that unknown to Smith, he himself, not Jones, will get the job. And also unknown to Smith, he himself has 10 coins in his pocket. So it turns out, uh, for one reason or another, that actually Smith is going to get the job. Um, maybe Jones, I don't know, gets hit by a car or something before he can take the job. So it ends up being that Smith is going to get the job. And Smith also just happens to have 10 coins in his pocket. So this proposition, um, proposition E, the man who will get the job has 10 coins in his pocket, is true, um, even though the proposition from which Smith it's not, it's not response, just it's not just true. Yeah. Um, he also believes it to be true. Yeah. And as we discussed, he is justified in believing this. Yeah, and I mean, he believes it because he inferred it from D. Um, and it looks like his which we agreed he was justified yeah. in believing. Um, so it looks like so we have a justified true belief. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I wanted to do jazz hands. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, so, I'm not on you. I've, I, I was on the. I wasn't filming you anyway, so we wouldn't have seen the jazz. As well, hands. you know, the jazz hands were for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it looks like we 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 don't want to say that Smith knew that he himself would get the job. He definitely didn't know that. Mm. He was probably likely shocked. He didn't uh, even believe it, right? Yeah, no, he, he didn't believe that specifically. But he did indeed have a justified true belief. Um, so Gettier looks like he is successful in demonstrating, uh, well, in, in providing an example of somebody having a belief that is both justified and true, but not having knowledge. Um, I, I know Smith certainly wouldn't say, oh, I knew I'd get that job. <laughs> that would be a weird thing for him to say. Uh, so we don't even, we, we, it wouldn't even make sense to make a knowledge claim in this case, um, or try to argue with it, at least in that regard. Um, quick note on just logic here. Uh, with that proposition D, if I, I said this before, if either part of that fails, then the whole proposition fails. That's how conjunctions work um, in logic. So, I mean, it could have been either um, either one of those where it failed. Um, I just it it seems obvious that it should be him him getting the job mm -hmm. that he doesn't know. Yeah. <laughs> Although if he's a neurotic coin counter, I don't know why he hasn't counted the coins <laughs> in his own pocket. Um, <laughs> what if he informed the proposition the man who will get the job has the same number of coins in his pocket as me? <laughs> oh, I don't. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> if he were a neurotic coin counter. <laughs> okay. Anyway, that is just a little weird. Yeah. Um, case two. Um, which... Okay, case two, yeah. If you didn't like the first case, Gettier's got uh, the director's cut edition for you. <laughs> um, yeah, well, yeah. You only need one. You only need one to show that justified true belief doesn't guarantee knowledge. Yeah, I mean, actually, that's that's kind of an important point, right? Like, yeah. you literally only need, like you say, you only need one case. Gettier presents two cases, but if you can find a single example of a situation where somebody has justified true belief, but they don't have knowledge, then you have shown that justified true belief is not sufficient for knowledge. Which is why I, I emphasize yeah. the guaranteeing. Yeah. Uh, it, it's um, meant to entirely guarantee it. So he offers up for our consideration, in case you had problems with that first ridiculous example, a potentially more ridiculous example right. that and, uses uh, so a different logical principle. I think that... Um, well, I, yeah, we're, I, I think, as I say, later we'll maybe give other examples, but you can... It's worth trying to think of examples for yourself. I mean, because you only need one um, to, to refute the analysis. So should we? 
Yes. Uh, why don't you, you take take the lead on case two? Okay, so let's suppose that Smith has strong evidence for the following proposition. F, Jones owns a Ford. Um, and yeah, so Smith's evidence might be that Jones has at all times uh, in the past, within Smith's memory, owned a car, always a Ford. Jones has just offered Smith a ride while driving a Ford. Uh, and that yes, seems yes. like good enough evidence. For, yeah, he's yeah, a Ford I mean, man. You know, yeah. yeah. And there he uh, is, in a Ford offering people rides. Like Smith has seen Jones as Ford. Maybe Jones has told Smith that he owns a Ford. I mean, we can add more evidence on here. If, well, if no, because we I, I, I don't want to add him lying. I mean, does it does it make a difference? Uh, so. Anyway, like but yeah, we, we could add more in. Like, yeah. I'm just saying, yeah. you know, if, if the justification presented here isn't strong enough for you, you can, you can assume yeah. other things, right? Um, Supplement it. Uh, okay, so... Let's imagine now that Smith has another friend, Brown, of whose whereabouts he is totally ignorant. Smith selects three place names quite at random and then constructs the following three propositions. So, G, either Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Boston. H, either Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Barcelona. I, either Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Brest, Livots, Liv, Liv, whatever that is. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's why I made you read this Lit one. <laughs> Litomsk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Little, uh, yeah, I can't. <laughs> yeah. Um, so wherever that place is. Um, okay, so each of these propositions is entailed by F. Um, so, it's, I mean, I, I, I guess we might d need to explain what's going on here. Um, why why that entailment follows just in the same way that we explained why the other yeah. entailment um, follows. So, I mean, I don't know. I, you said that... that, that I, it's kind of difficult to come up with a, a really intuitive case for this. But I suppose the, the way to think about it is just that, look, if you have an or claim, if you're saying like, you know, either somebody owns this car uh, or something else. I mean, maybe a more intuitive example of this would be something like saying either Jones owns a Ford or Jones owns a Peugeot. Um, so I I, uh, I actually prefer to um, I w when I talk about so this uses a principle called disjunction introduction, um, which is used in proofing, um, and just like when we looked at D and E those sentences from case one, um, we were talking about the truth conditions. I I said, you know I, I tell my students if you can find a way that D can be true and E can be false, then we need to talk, <laughs> we need to write a paper. Um, in, in the same way, we're gonna look at truth conditions. So, or statements, uh, disjunctions, work differently to and statements. In order for an or statement to be true, you only need one part of it to be true. So I could say something like, um, I'm going to the store and I'm going to buy rum or vodka. Now I can go to the store and I can buy rum and I haven't lied to you. Or I can go to the store and I can buy vodka and I haven't lied to you. Or maybe I'm gonna have a great big party and I buy both rum and vodka. Because of the way logic works, uh, I still have not lied to you. The only circumstance under which an or statement is false is when you do neither of the things, when neither of those things occur. Um, there's a word that philosophers like to use instead of occur, obtain, when neither <laughs> when neither of those things obtain, uh, which is to say it is not the case that I buy either rum or vodka. I, in fact, don't even go to the store. Um, then I've definitely said something that's propositionally false yeah. when I say that. So because you only need one part to be true, you can add whatever you want in for yeah. the other part of it. Um, that's a completely legitimate move because the truth conditions are going to be the same. Um, you just need the one thing to be true for the sentence to be true. So I could say something like, I, I mean, I like using ultimatums as an example, like either you do the dishes or you get the hell out of my house, <laughs> right? Um, and clearly what I'm hoping, hoping happens here is that they, uh, they do the dishes. I suppose they could do the dishes and get the hell out of my house. Um, but you only need, you can add whatever you want on the end of that. Um, 
Yeah, well, Either you do the dishes or your mother is a wench, right? Like, I don't, I don't know, something horrible. It, you can put pure nonsense on the other side. Well, you wouldn't want to pure, put pure nonsense on the other well, side. Well, you can that. if you want, uh, but... Uh, that's either as long as it's grammatical. Jones owns a Ford or... <laughs> Either Jones owns a Ford or my monkey's, my uncle's a monkey, right? Yeah. Like these statements work because we recognize that you only need one of those things to be true. Well, that's why, I mean, the, the example, you know, I was saying I, either Jones owns a Ford or Jones owns a Peugeot. Um, that's just a sort of maybe more intuitive case where you can see that that would be true if only one of those things were true. Um, and maybe somebody... I wanted to include cases where both Sorry? were true. I wanted to include cases where both were true. Yeah, both of those could and be true as well. Because he could he could own both he could own both a Ford and a Peugeot. But I just mean like I think that that I don't know that's it, it's difficult to because this is obviously it's really weird to imagine somebody um, kind of being like either Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Barcelona. That's just yeah, a really yeah. really no, strange I gotcha. example. Whereas I just somebody, wanted to explain the rule. Yeah, I, no, I, I get it, but I'm just sort of I, just I thought, have okay, problem with disjunction introduction as should you and everyone else um, because of explosion uh, which is a whole other thing uh, but I, I have problems with disjunction introduction it feels like it's cheating even to me um, so I wanted to explain why you can introduce whatever you want into a disjunction yeah. um, into a war statement and not actually change the sentence, but or the, not change the proposition. I mean, the key point is just that a disjunction is true just as long as at least one of the disjuncts is true. Um, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, that's okay, the... Well, I didn't find it. <laughs> Sorry, that I didn't. I said, oh, I just, I get excited <laughs> about how this stuff works and why it works. Um, uh, I just don't want people to just accept these the the truth conditions for these symbols. I, I want them to understand why. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Okay. So, well, hopefully we've explained why that works. Then um, <laughs> it it totally is entailed. So yeah. Uh, then get it. it says okay. Imagine that Smith realizes the entailment of each of these propositions he has constructed by F and proceeds to accept G H I on the basis of F. Um, so Smith has correctly inferred them from a proposition which from which he has strong evidence and he's therefore justified in believing them um, because obviously if you realize that a proposition is entailed by a proposition you already accept then you accept that new proposition. Again, we find ourselves imagining Smith is a yeah. logician or philosopher and just having fun little thoughts in his head. And he's like, oh, would you look at that entailment? Maybe he's just thinking about disjunction introduction. He's like, what strange <laughs> thoughts can I accept? Um, <laughs> but the, now we have, have to imagine that two further conditions hold. Jones does not own a Ford. Um, but is at present driving a rented car. And secondly, by mere coincidence and unknown to Smith, um, Brown actually is in Barcelona. So proposition, uh, in the case of proposition H, it's true that Brown is in Barcelona. Um, so proposition H is true in virtue of the fact that Brown is in Barcelona not in virtue of the fact that Jones owns a Ford, because Jones doesn't own a Ford, right? It turns out actually Jones doesn't own a Ford. Um, so propositions G and I are both false, because it's not true that Jones owns a Ford, and it's not true that Brown is in Boston. Um, it's not true that Jones owns a Ford, and it's not true that Brown is in Brest Litovsk, or whatever that is. Um, but for proposition H, although it's not true that Jones owns a Ford, it is true that Brown is in Barcelona, even though Smith doesn't doesn't know that Brown is in Barcelona. Uh, so it looks like Smith, again, has a justified true belief in H, but intuitively he doesn't know H. Ta-da! Right. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's true because the, the wrong half of the disjunction uh, is true, which makes the whole disjunction true. Yeah. And he knows it. And we all agreed he was justified. Mm -hmm. he, the justification was just located in the wrong bit. Yeah. So yeah, 
that one's harder to argue with. I was it, it again that uh, the first time I read this uh, in that freshman class, um, I, I didn't understand why my professor said this was the stronger of the two cases. It seemed absurd to me. Um, and I think it's because he didn't explain why disjunctions work that way. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to really okay. hone in on that point. Um, because I didn't understand why why one could accept that or see the entailment. Um, yeah, I see. Um, I, 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 I agree with you. I think I think it is I think it's a better example in that it's it's a stronger example. Um, yeah, no, he was absolutely right. And once I came to better understand logic, um, I was like, oh, yeah, obviously, that's the stronger case. Um, I, 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 I can't, I can't even begin to argue with this one. Um, uh, other than to say, like, the justification was on the wrong side, but the wrong side, what does that mean? That doesn't exist in logic. Yeah, I mean, you, you uh, have a true proposition I mean, there that if if you're not justified in believing a logical entailment, then what are you justified in believing? Yeah. Right? Uh, that's that's what both of these come down to is you have to deny that somebody is justified in believing a logical entailment. Uh, and I don't think that's something that anyone is quite ready to give up. No, I mean, when you see how it works, I think I think certainly case two is tough. You can't, I mean, like the, the kind of objection that I have to case one, I don't see, I don't think you can apply that to case two. Um, yeah. So, but it is... I mean, you it, could say, like, that's a weird thing to be thinking, um, yeah. <laughs> but... It's, it's odd, <laughs> but like, once you see that, yeah, if you, if you, if you have an or claim, an A or B, Right, you you can add whatever you want on there, and it's true, just in case one of those conjuncts is true. Once you see how that works, I mean, it, that's that's yeah. case closed, <laughs> done. Right. Yeah, you you understand how or but, works. That's it. That's all it takes, really. But it is still, I mean, it, both of these cases are really counterintuitive. I mean, they're they're just very very strange. They're very strange ways to be thinking, um, but. Like we said, we only need one example of a justified true belief that's not knowledge in order for the justified true belief analysis to fail. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought it might just be worth noting a couple of maybe more more intuitive examples. Um, so one example that I kind of like is uh, there's a, an example of... Who came up with this? I think I've it was got, I've got... Uh... There's, well, I'll just say this. There's, there's an example of uh, the, the sheep Alvin in the field. Alvin Goldman um, is the so, one who came up with the barn one. That's responding to something a little bit different, though. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so, I mean, okay, here's, here's, here's um, an example. I don't know who came um, up with the sheep one. Let's say that you're passing the field and... You think you see a sheep in there like i don't know you, you see some white fluff and it's i don't know got a what black face sheeps don't they I don't know, what what do sheeps look like it looks like a sheep it's it looks exactly like a sheep <laughs> um so you form the belief that there is a sheep in the field and in fact it's a very realistic model of a sheep right that's what you're actually looking at but i mean like we form beliefs on the basis of our perception all the time, right? I believe that there's a computer in front of me because I can see it. If I look out the window and, you know, there's a bird flying by, right, I form that belief on the basis of my sensory perception. So it looks like if we can have any knowledge about the world, that's going to be justified by our sensory perception. So if you're passing a field and you, you see something that looks exactly like a sheep and you form the belief there is a sheep in that field, that looks like pretty good justification. But suppose it's actually a very realistic model of a sheep. However, just behind a hill that you can't see, there is in fact a real sheep in the field. So your belief is true and it's justified. So it's a justified true belief, but intuitively it doesn't, doesn't look like that's knowledge, right? Yeah, it doesn't feel like you knew yeah. 
So there was a sheep in that field. You didn't you didn't perceive the sheep. You perceived a model of the sheep. But it just so happened. And if that anybody there was thinks actually... like people aren't going around creating models of sheep, um, uh, it, it just as well could be a very woolly dog. Yeah. Right. That you have seen uh, um, in that field, <laughs> which is how I've always heard it. I've never heard the facsimile sheep. <laughs> I possibly confused it. it with the fake barn case, you know, model of barn, yeah. model of sheep. But. I have that one. Uh, if you want to <laughs> do that one really quickly, um, at all, I don't know. We can. I mean, like, I think all of these examples are, are useful. Um, just yeah. As... So, um, so this is Alvin Goldman, um, and this is actually in response to some responses to Getty, yeah. um, which I don't particularly want to get into well if we, um, if we were to get into that it would be a whole video series yeah that would be well there there, there are two uh one's called no false premise uh and one is called causation um those are the names of the problems people could google them or maybe we could do a follow-up on this i don't know people are like man i need more epistemology <laughs> from the 70s or whatever <laughs> but uh so Henry is driving in the countryside with his son. For the boy's edification, Henry identifies various objects on the landscape as they come into view. That's a cow, says Henry. I just love reading this to my students. That's a tractor. That's a silo. That's a barn. Oh, boy. Etc. Henry has no doubt about the identity of these objects. In particular, he has no doubt that the last mentioned object is a barn, which indeed it is. Each of the objects, each of the identified objects has features characteristic of its type. Moreover, each object is fully in view. Henry has excellent eyesight and he has enough time to look at them reasonably carefully since there is little traffic to distract him. Now, suppose that, unknown to Henry, the district he has just entered is full of paper mache facsimiles of barns. These facsimiles look from the road exactly like barns, but are really just facades without back walls or interiors, quite incapable of being used as barns. I love how thorough that is. I just think this is a great example of philosophic writing. It's so dull, but it's also kind of hilarious. And like my instinct in reading this is to be like, well, who's to say that's not a barn? Like that's a construct, the concept of a barn. So just to respond to me, He's like, no, they're quite incapable of being used as barns. They are so cleverly constructed that travelers invariably mistake them for barns. Having just entered the district, Henry has not encountered any facsimiles. The object he sees is a genuine barn. But if the object on that site were a facsimile, Henry would mistake it for a barn. So that one's a bit different because, again, it's a response to some of them. But it also works for the yeah. or some objections to Gettier. But it also works as an example um, of a potential Gettier case. Yeah, a justified uh, there true are belief. That's... Hundreds of these because apparently the only like real, well, not real, but the most legitimate issue people seem to have with Gettier is that those cases are silly <laughs> and they're like, I can do better than that. <laughs> so yeah, I, I enjoy those. I was assigned to, uh, to make one of my own. Yeah. Um, and I did one about like a dictator, uh, being dead and like a news headline, but actually the newspaper was trying to, overthrow him so lying and uh, say, saying he was dead yeah, yeah. <laughs> but and that like i found that totally plausible right like if you're a third world dictator i could totally see people conspiring to oust you yeah. and start a coup by uh lying about your death mm. um but we rely on newspapers all the time right um so once you understand like the the thrust of um how the Gettier cases work, it's really easy to make much more reasonable ones. Yeah, well, the I mean, the way to do it, I guess, if you want a general recipe for it, is you just have to imagine a situation where somebody has a justified false belief. So somebody has a, they believe something falsely, but with good justification. And then you just twist it so that- Make it true. They happen to be true by luck 
right? So it's like there happens to be a real sheep in the field. Um, or, or, the I dictator mean, actually the, happens um, to have died in the night. <laughs> I think maybe the most like obvious, I don't know, just intuitive obvious example of this that for me at least was, um, you know, you wake up in the morning, go downstairs, look at the clock and it says 8.15 and the clock has actually stopped, right? Uh, but just um, by luck, it actually is exactly 8.15. Um, yeah. All right, well, yeah, I think that's everything. Hopefully we did a good job with that. I think we did a good job with that. <laughs> you think so? I don't know. Do you think Do you think I should just upload all of it? Because there was that yeah, that's stuff fine. at the beginning where we kind of went off in a funny direction. Yeah, and this as well so that you could say goodbye. <laughs> goodbye, everybody. <laughs> Yeah, um, no, because I, I think it's, yeah, I, I would, I would include that because I think, no, I think you were right to call me out. It's just, we teach differently and I think that's how people learn. Um, and I know for sure that if I do things two different ways, um, my, I, I capture way more students, like way more of them understand the concept. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to stop the recording now then. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs>